Nestled within the brain and brainstem are 12 unique groups of nerve cells. These cluster together into nuclei, which themselves project neurons which are intrinsically involved in the way we perceive and interact with the world. Without them, we would have no sight, smell or taste, no sense of hearing or balance, no ability to swallow, no facial expressions, gut motility, no speech and much more. These nuclei process information that defines who we are, and without them, the world would be a dull place indeed. The 12 nerves originating in these nuclei are known as the cranial nerves, and today we're going to learn just what makes them so important. Whilst most cranial nerves originate from the brainstem, the first two can trace their beginnings to the cerebral cortex of the brain. Cranial nerve 1 is known as the olfactory nerve, and its chief function is to provide us with a sense of smell. Here we have a sagittal view of the nasal cavity, with the nose on the left hand side and the start of the nasopharynx on the right. The part we're concerned with here is the roof, where the olfactory mucosa resides. These specialised pseudostratified columnar cells detect particles associated with smell and convert this information into electrical impulses. The olfactory receptor cells in the olfactory mucosa group together into tiny olfactory nerves which travel upwards to penetrate the superior ethmoid bone via perforations in its cribriform plate. Once through the cribriform plate, these nerves synapse and produce the olfactory bulb, which is the most recognisable part of the olfactory nerve. This then travels posteriorly into the brain to carry information relating to smell. The olfactory nerve is purely sensory in function, and we refer to it as a pure, special visceral sensory nerve. Cranial nerve 2 is the optic nerve, and it also originates from the cerebral cortex. It serves to provide the second of our primary senses, sight. Worth briefly noting is that some anatomists would consider the optic nerve in fact to be a tract, as it sits entirely within the central nervous system, but for today's tutorial we'll call it the second cranial nerve. The optic nerve starts in the retina and receives information about light entering the eye via signalling from rod and cone photoreceptors that lie in its interior. The ganglion cells of the retina join together at the optic disc to travel posteriorly into the head as the optic nerve. This nerve leaves the eye socket to enter the neurocranium via the optic canal. Like the olfactory nerve, the optic nerve is purely sensory and acts only to perceive light entering the eye and pass this information backwards towards the brain. Unlike the olfactory nerve, however, the optic nerve derives from ectoderm in the embryo. For this reason, it is considered a pure, special somatic sensory nerve. The third cranial nerve is closely associated with the optic nerve in both location and function. It is known as the oculomotor nerve, and as its name suggests, it's involved in most of the movements of the eye. The oculomotor nerve enters the posterior eye socket via the superior orbital fissure. It then divides into two main branches, one going superiorly and one going inferiorly in relation to the eyeball. The superior branch splits once more into two smaller branches, one to the levator palpebrae superioris muscle, which raises the eyelid, and one to the superior rectus muscle, which pulls the top of the eyeball down to turn your gaze upwards. The inferior branch is more complex and divides into four terminal branches, one to the medial rectus muscle, which turns the gaze inwards, one to the inferior rectus muscle, which turns it downwards, and one to the inferior oblique muscle, which lifts the gaze upwards and outwards, as well as rotating it externally a little. The fourth and last branch of the inferior part of the oculomotor nerve is unique in that it carries parasympathetic nerve fibres. These travel via the ciliary ganglion to the pupillary sphincter and the ciliary muscles that attach to the lens. The parasympathetic actions of the oculomotor nerve are to constrict the pupil in response to light and reshape the lens to adapt it for close-up vision. The oculomotor nerve works very closely with the optic nerve but has no sensory function of its own. For this reason, we can refer to it as a purely motor nerve. Specifically, it's a general somatic motor nerve to the muscles of the eye and a general visceral motor nerve to the pupillary and ciliary muscles. The fourth and sixth cranial nerves are usually discussed together as they serve similar functions in the eye. In fact, very similar functions to the aforementioned oculomotor nerve. 
The fourth is the very thin but long trochlear nerve. This enters the eye in the same way as the oculomotor, via the superior orbital fissure. The only action of the trochlear nerve is to innervate the superior oblique muscle, which turns the gaze down and out whilst also internally rotating the eye. The sixth cranial nerve is known as the abducens nerve and is really similar to the trochlear. It enters via the superior orbital fissure and gives only one motor branch to the lateral rectus muscle, which turns the gaze outwards. As the trochlear and abducens nerves have no sensory actions, they are purely motor nerves. They are considered general somatic motor nerves. Here's an anterior view of the eye socket and how the aforementioned nerves enter it. That's it for the nerves affecting the eye. You may have noticed we skipped over the fifth cranial nerve, and that's because it serves a complex and unique function. The fifth cranial nerve is known as the trigeminal nerve, as it splits into three major branches that have different actions in and around the face. Let's look at the sensory functions of the trigeminal nerve first. All three branches of the trigeminal nerve supply sensation to the face, from superior scalp to chin. The first branch is the ophthalmic nerve, called so due to its close relation to the eye. Like most of the nerves we covered previously, the ophthalmic nerve enters the posterior eye socket via the superior orbital fissure. Inside the orbit, the ophthalmic nerve divides into the lacrimal, frontal and nasociliary nerves, which go on to provide sensation to the upper face, cornea and the frontal and ethmoid sinuses. The next major branch of the trigeminal is the maxillary nerve. This produces many branches, the more noticeable of which enters the orbit via the inferior orbital fissure. The maxillary nerve provides sensation to the middle part of the face, including the maxillary sinus, the upper teeth and the nasal cavity. The third and final major branch is the mandibular nerve. This follows a complex path to provide sensation to the rest of the face. This includes the ear, the floor of the mouth and the lower row of teeth. That covers the sensation of the trigeminal nerve, but this essential structure has more to offer. Its mandibular branch also provides motor input to the muscles involved in chewing, the muscles of mastication. These are the large temporalis, the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles, and the masseter. It also innervates some small muscles within the ear, palate, and neck. Lastly, the trigeminal nerve carries some parasympathetic nerve fibers that travel to the salivary glands in the face. Its numerous functions pin the trigeminal nerve as the general somatic sensory nerve as well as a special visceral motor nerve as it supplies muscles derived from the first pharyngeal arch. Okay, that's a lot of information. Let's have a quick recap. Cranial nerve 1 is the olfactory nerve, which senses smell. 2 is the optic nerve, which does vision. 3, 4 and 6 are the oculomotor, trochlear and abducens nerves, which supply the muscles of the eye and five is the trigeminal nerve, which supplies sensation to the face and motor input to the muscles of mastication. Right, let's continue. The seventh cranial nerve is mostly concerned with moving the muscles of facial expression and is thus referred to simply as the facial nerve. It enters the neurocranium via the stylomastoid foramen on the underside of the skull. Here it produces a few small branches before travelling anteriorly to pass right through the parotid gland in the cheek. Inside the parotid gland, the facial nerve divides into its five terminal parts, the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, marginal mandibular and cervical nerves. The specific muscles that these nerves innervate are beyond the scope of today's session, but just know that all of the expressive movements of your ears, forehead, eyebrows, eyes, mouth, cheeks and lips are all controlled by the actions of the facial nerve. It also innervates some small muscles in your neck. As well as its huge motor function, the facial nerve also plays a key role in sensing taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue via its corda tympani branch. The facial nerve also carries some parasympathetic nerve fibres that travel to the salivary glands, much in the same way as the trigeminal nerve. However, it has no involvement in the parotid gland, despite passing directly through it. Lastly, it takes sensory input from a tiny region in the concha of the ear. Its numerous functions have the facial nerve pinned as a complex mixture of general somatic sensory to the concha, special visceral sensory to the anterior tongue, special visceral motor to the facial muscles, and general visceral motor to the salivary glands.
The eighth cranial nerve is responsible for sensing the complex inputs of both hearing and balance. It resides entirely within the head, performing all of its work in the inner ear. It is known as the vestibulocochlear nerve and is comprised of two parts, vestibular fibers, which sense balance, and cochlear fibers, which sense sound. These fibers originate in the vestibular apparatus and the cochlea, respectively. We'll discuss how hearing and balance work in more detail in a later video, but for now just know that these two nerve groups join together to travel back towards the brain via the internal acoustic meatus. As it has no motor functions, the vestibulocochlear nerve is considered to be a purely special somatic sensory nerve. The ninth cranial nerve isn't as flashy as some of the others and is thus often forgotten. However, it arguably provides some of the most essential functions of all of the cranial nerves. This is the glossopharyngeal nerve, and it leaves the inferior skull via the jugular foramen. From here, it travels down the angle of the face, roughly following the path of the internal carotid artery. It continues down into the neck and eventually penetrates the back of the pharynx between the two uppermost constrictor muscles. One of the main functions of the glossopharyngeal nerve is sensory. It provides sensation to the middle ear and eustachian tube, the back of the mouth and the palatine tonsils. It also takes general taste sensation from the posterior one-third of the tongue. Remember that the facial nerve does the anterior two-thirds. Additionally, it sends a bespoke pair of nerves to both the carotid sinus and the carotid body, which are involved in sensing blood pressure and blood oxygenation respectively. The glossopharyngeal nerve is also the nerve that provides parasympathetic innervation to the parotid salivary gland. While these nerve fibres travel with part of the trigeminal nerve, they actually originate from the glossopharyngeal. Lastly, the glossopharyngeal nerve has a tiny motor function to the stylopharyngeus muscle in the pharynx. The numerous functions of the glossopharyngeal nerve make it tied with the vagus for the most individual different nerve fibre types contained within it. It is general somatic sensory to provide general sensation to the posterior tongue and special visceral sensory to provide taste to the same region. General visceral sensory to provide sensation to the carotid body and sinus, general visceral motor to the parotid gland and special visceral motor to the stylopharyngeus muscle. Now we'll look at the famous 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. This has a huge number of functions and its influence stretches all the way from the head to the distal gastrointestinal tract. We'll cover the salient points here. The vagus nerve also leaves the skull via the jugular foramen before passing down the neck with the internal jugular vein and common carotid artery in the carotid sheath. From the base of the neck, it continues downwards to enter the thorax. The vagus nerve takes sensory information from the external ear in the head, as well as the heart and parts of the pharynx, larynx and gastrointestinal tract in the rest of the body. It also provides motor innervation to most of the muscles of the pharynx and larynx. Lastly, it takes a tiny amount of taste sensation from the tongue and in the lower body provides a huge chunk of the parasympathetic supply to the heart and the organs of the gastrointestinal system. Its many roles lead to the vagus nerve being considered a general somatic sensory nerve to the ear, pharynx and larynx, a general visceral sensory and general visceral motor nerve to the pharynx, larynx, heart and most of the gastrointestinal tract, a special sensory nerve to the tongue, and finally, a special visceral motor nerve to the pharynx and larynx. The penultimate 11th cranial nerve is known as the accessory nerve. It has both a spinal and a cranial component. The spinal component is unique amongst the cranial nerves as it actually originates from the cervical spinal cord. It then travels upwards into the neurocranium via the foramen magnum before meeting its cranial component and leaving the skull with the vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves via the jugular foramen. From here on, the cranial component of the accessory nerve merges with the vagus nerve and performs the same jobs as that. The spinal component, however, travels downwards and posteriorly into the posterior triangle of the neck. On its journey, it provides motor innervation to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which flexes, rotates and extends the neck, and the trapezius muscle, which essentially is used to shrug the shoulders. Given this, the accessory nerve can be considered mostly a general somatic motor nerve to these two muscles, 
as well as partly a special visceral motor nerve as it travels with the vagus. And finally, we have the 12th cranial nerve, thankfully a rather simple one. This is the hypoglossal nerve, which travels to the underside of the tongue to supply most of the muscles involved in its movements. It leaves the skull via the hypoglossal canal before passing just below the angle of the mandible to enter the tongue. In the tongue, it innervates all four of the intrinsic muscles, the superior and inferior longitudinal, transverse and vertical muscles, all of which carefully modulate the shape of the tongue during swallowing and speaking. It also innervates three of the four extrinsic tongue muscles, the genioglossus, which protrudes and depresses the body of the tongue whilst pulling its tip downwards, the hyoglossus, which depresses and retracts the tongue, and the styloglossus, which elevates and retracts the tongue. The palatoglossus, which elevates the posterior tongue, is innervated by the vagus nerve. All of this serves to say that the hypoglossal nerve is purely a general somatic motor nerve to the muscles of the tongue. Right, that's all 12 cranial nerves. Let's do a quick recap of them all before we finish. Cranial nerve 1 is the olfactory nerve, which senses smell. 2 is the optic nerve, which does vision. 3, 4 and 6 are the oculomotor, trochlear and abducens nerves, which supply the muscles of the eye. 5 is the trigeminal nerve, which supplies sensation to the face and motor input to the muscles of mastication. 7 is the facial nerve, which mostly provides motor input to the muscles of facial expression, as well as taste to the anterior tongue. 8 is the vestibulocochlear nerve, which senses balance and hearing. 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve, which innervates the parotid gland, takes taste from the posterior tongue, and senses blood pressure and oxygenation. 10 is the vagus nerve, which provides motor and sensory input to most of the larynx and pharynx, as well as parasympathetic input to most of the thoracic and abdominal viscera. 11 is the accessory nerve, which innervates the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. And finally, 12 is the hypoglossal nerve, which innervates most of the muscles of the tongue. And there we go. That's a complete overview of the extracranial anatomy and functions of all 12 of the cranial nerves. There's a whole lot more content to cover here, so we'll be gradually releasing more videos on the detailed anatomy of all of these cranial nerves as time goes on. Remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss these as they're released. That's all for now. I hope you learned something and have a great day.